Hello, I'm Jonathan Mast. Welcome back to the Wellness Center. And next up, we have Dr. Bartlett. Dr. Bartlett, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jonathan. Welcome everyone to the Wellness Center and Sedgwick Virtual RIMS Week. We're so happy to be with you today. And the topic is catching Z's. Um, so as Jonathan introduced me, I'm Dr. Bartlett. I'm the Senior Medical Officer at Sedgwick. And uh, with me today, I have the distinct honor of uh, my son joining me, Sean Bartlett. And Sean, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Hey there, thanks for having me. My name's Sean. I promise all of those letters after my, my name means something. Um, I'm a certified practitioner of neuro-linguistic programming, a certified practitioner of timeline therapy, and a certified clinical hypnotherapist. That's all kind of scary stuff, if you ask me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next. So with that, we're going to take it away and uh, do our best to teach you a little bit about sleep. Uh, next slide, Jonathan, if you will. So first things first, we're going to talk about Peter Tripp. This is a really interesting story. Peter Tripp was a radio DJ in New York in 1959, and for a publicity stunt, he pledged to raise money for March of Dimes by staying awake for 201 consecutive hours. I'll save you from doing the math. That's almost eight and a half days. Every scientist, every doctor, they approached him and they said, please don't do this. It's not a good idea. It's not good for you. He said, well, I'm going to do it anyway. And they're like, okay, well, if you're going to do it, can we, can we study you? And he said, yeah, sure. And so he, he plays his, his scheduled set every evening. And he pulled himself together for the whole time to play his set pretty well. First two days went okay. Day three rolls around and it gets weird. He goes to a nearby hotel room to shower and change. And he gets out of the shower. He opens a drawer to get some clothes out and he sees flames bursting up into the air. And he thinks that the scientists are conspiring against him to get him to stop this. And he becomes incredibly paranoid and he starts to get aggressive. And by day four, he reports spiders and things crawling on his skin that weren't there. Day five, he thinks that the government and the Secret Service were um, in a conspiracy against him. And just imagine Peter Tripp running through Times Square as these doctors and scientists are chasing after him, trying to catch him because they're trying to help him. And he thinks everybody's out to get him. You know, he's becoming very paranoid. Um, so bad things happen when you don't sleep. Long story short, um, a lot of people say, actually, personal reports, um, his family and friends, they say that he was never the same after doing this. He did, did he make actually it? Complete it? Yeah, he did. He did 201 consecutive hours. And then, if I'm not mistaken, he slept for 18 and a half hours in a row. And he, re he returned to normal pretty quickly, but um, as far as his sleep schedule goes, but a lot of his family and friends said that he was never the same after this. Hmm. Thank you. So why is sleep important? Well, I'll tell you that. Um, there's a lot of reasons. Actually, there's a lot of physiological reasons why sleep is so important. Um, what we do know is that if you don't get enough sleep, you're prone to depression, seizures, high blood pressure. Your immunity is compromised almost after one night of uh, lessened sleep. Also, sleep plays a role in your metabolism. Um, even one night of missed sleep can cause you to go into a bit of a pre-diabetic state in a normal, otherwise healthy individual. So it's really important that we understand how sleep plays a role. It plays a role with our heart rate, with our metabolism, with our body temperature, and as I talked about the blood pressure and all that, and during sleep, we know that what happens is muscles repair, um, organs and other cells repair in the body because your, your uh, brain works to clean out the whole system. It's almost like a reboot of a computer, if you will. And hormones are definitely a big player in sleep. So when you sleep, your growth hormone goes up and your cortisone levels goes down. Cortisol is your stress hormone. 
it's not good to have that at a high level. And, and so it's super important that you get sleep so that it sort of resets some of those hormones. The other thing for those of you who are worried about the quarantine 15, like we're all comforting ourselves with food these days, right? Um, we know that if you lose some sleep, that leptin and uh, ghrelin, ghrelin um, are secreted and that changes your whole hunger structure and how you uh, want more food. So um, studies are very clear about what happens when you're sleep deprived and it's definitely associated with decreased uh, brain activity, loss of focus and concentration, and even enhanced performance if you get the right amount of sleep. There's been studies of basketball players who will say uh, that show that they have better performance on the court when they get the right amount of sleep. Next slide. So this is a typical sleep cycle. And the important thing to notice from this image here is that during the first part of the night, that's when you're gonna get the most amount of the deep restorative sleep. You see as the night goes on and progresses, you do, you're not getting as much uh, deep sleep and you're not dipping into stage four, which is a delta wave, which is just a really slow brain wave. So at the beginning of the night, you're getting the most amount of deep restorative sleep. This is why it's really important to go to bed you know, sometime between 9 and 11 at the, at the very late end of the, of the things. I would say 10 p.m. is usually a good sleep time for most people. Depends on your sleep type, but next slide, please. And do you want to talk about REM for a minute? Yeah, REM stands for rapid eye movement. There's actually two categories of sleep. Um, scientists are very creative. They named them REM and non-REM. So, um, <laughs> You have rapid eye movement and then you have non-rapid eye movement. So you start awake, you go into uh, basically staggering into lower and lower brain waves as you go down. <clears throat> and then you dip all the way back up and just, uh, just below awake is when you hit your REM cycle. So that completes one sleep cycle. And then that cycle from awake down delta back up to, to REM right here, that's one cycle. And that repeats as the night goes on. And that cycle is about 90 minutes, give or take, and that's the first one only. As the night progresses, your sleep cycle gets shorter and shorter and shorter. So this is actually why typically you'll find yourself waking up at a slight noise or something like that earlier in the, in the morning rather than right when you go to sleep because you're much more likely to be in deep sleep in the late evening. So what if I don't get enough sleep? Um, that's a tough one. So not only does it impact your cortisol, your stress hormone is high, your growth hormone is low, but for you men out there, even women, it lowers your testosterone level and nobody wants that happening, right? So we know that less sleep means that you can be, you can have depression, anxiety, as well as it promotes inflammation in the body. So it's really important that you do try to get enough sleep. Um, uh, interestingly enough, there's some research that also shows that if you don't get enough sleep, your level of empathy for other people is lower, meaning that you don't care as much about other people. So uh, it is important. Next it becomes slide. harder to connect with them, right? Yeah. Yep. You know, on this note, I wanted to throw in one extra thing. You mentioned about testosterone. So research by Dr. Matthew Walker, uh, he's an Oxford doc. Him and his team are sort of the world leading experts on sleep right now. Highly recommend looking up him and all of his research. He did a study and they showed that men who sleep less than seven hours per night have significantly smaller testicles than men who sleep seven to nine hours per night. This is true and it's dangerous because a man who sleeps six hours on average has the testosterone level that of somebody 10 years older than them. Incredibly damaging for the body. And I'm sure people are happy to hear that right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Next slide. So how much sleep do I need? I'll tell you, it really depends on your age. 
Um, the younger you are, the more sleep you need. The older you are, the less sleep you need. We've all seen that, right? Babies sleep all the time. We're elderly people. Um, they may go to bed early, but they wake up at one in the morning and they can't fall back asleep because they require less sleep. So on average, Americans are getting about six hours of sleep a night. I'm not sure that that's quite enough. I would, I would say seven to eight hours is a little bit better to shoot for. Um, and there's also, I'm sure some of you have heard this, but there's research on high schoolers where um, we all know if you've ever had a child in high school, it's hard to drag them out of bed in the morning. It's hard for them to care about doing anything early in the morning. And it's because they require that sleep. And all the research has said, ideally, high school should start school around 11 or 12 noon. But our educational system in the United States has not caught up to that kind of philosophy in adapting to the type of time that different age groups need. Um, but interestingly enough, there was a study in Sweden where they had a group of people and they only allowed them to sleep for four hours per night for two nights in a row. And then they were photographed and judged by a big audience. And the audience found these people to A, look sleepy, um, they were less attractive, they were less healthy. So they were perceived as people that you wouldn't even want to socialize with. Um, then there was another study um, that showed a group of people um, that sleep for four hours, one single night, just one night. Um, and then they blood tested them. And um, after only one night sleep, their immune system was compromised by 40%. So they had less of a resistance to infection. So it is definitely important to understand how sleep impacts your entire body. Yeah, and on this note, um, like you said earlier, depending on what you do and how old you are will determine how much sleep you need. And a lot of our top performers, Olympic athletes, these types of people, they strategically sleep much longer than us. So Serena Williams, for example, famous tennis player, she sleeps 11 hours a night. Federer, 11 to 12 hours a night. Usain Bolt, for example, fastest man alive. He was only awake for 30 minutes when he broke one of his world records. You know, he sleeps about 12 hours a night. That's interesting. So how can you improve your sleep? My hope is that you will come away from this presentation having at least five or six things that you can start doing immediately to improve your sleep quality and maybe your time of sleep. Let's head into the next one, which is circadian rhythm. So first thing we're gonna talk about is the circadian rhythm. You may have heard of this before. This is basically just your body's internal sleep and wake cycle. It's an internal clock you have. Your circadian rhythm is running all day, every day, whether you sleep or don't sleep. It doesn't matter what time you go to sleep. Although if you go to sleep really, really late, wake up really late, it will throw it off but your circadian rhythm governs everything in your body from your body temperature to your hormonal releases down to the bowel movements. It's incredibly important to keep this stable um, throughout your life, actually. And next thing we're gonna talk about is the blue light. So, perfect, thank you. So if you think of it this way, the, as far as human civilization is concerned, electricity is a fairly new invention. So before we had a light bulb, the only light source we had was fire. And our brain sort of uses these two different wavelengths of blue light and red light from the fire to adapt and, you know, engage with our environment. So if you get blue light in the morning, this blue wavelength of light is only present from sunrise to 11 a.m. If you get blue light in the morning for about 45 minutes, ideally an hour, if you can swing an hour, do an hour unobstructed into your eyes, this will help reboot and reset your circadian rhythm. So I don't mean stare into the sun. What I'm talking about is you want your eyes exposed to the atmosphere. 
So basically not behind glasses or contacts or sunglasses or a window or a car windshield, just expose the atmosphere. Feel free to go on a walk. Feel free to sit on your patio that is completely shaded. You just want your eyes exposed to the atmosphere with no man-made glass between your eyes and the sky, basically. So getting this blue light in the morning for about 45 minutes to an hour, this will help reboot your circadian rhythm before 11 a.m. That's the key. Next slide, please. So pink Himalayan salt lamps. I have four of these. I love these things. You may have seen these in like a wellness spa or a massage place. I have two, you see one actually right here. I have two in my room and two in my living room. And like I said, how electricity was a fairly new invention. We, before light bulbs, we were staring at fire and fire gives off the same frequency of light, this red, orange, yellow glow as these pink Himalayan salt lamps. So this salt lamp is giving off the same frequency as a fire. So what I do is when the sun goes down, I turn off all the lights in my apartment and my only light source are these pink Himalayan salt lamps. And these have been a game changer for me. This one along with the next one, uh, which is blue light blocking glasses. I have some right here. These are incredible. If you have to do work in the evening and you're looking at a screen, I highly recommend getting a pair of these. They make clear ones and they make orange ones. There is a very distinct difference. You'll see the clear ones and the orange ones online. You can spend anywhere from 20 bucks to $100 on these. The clear ones, if you work on a computer screen all day, every day, like most Americans do, I highly recommend getting some clear ones. They will reduce eye strain. They only block about 35% of blue light. At night, however, when you want your brain to be sort of deactivating. You don't want to activate it by getting this blue light from our screens and our TVs and our phones and our tablets into your eyes. This will block, the orange one specifically will block 100% of melatonin suppressing wavelength and 99% of the entire blue spectrum. So I wear these about two hours before I go to sleep. If I have work to do on a computer, if I'm not looking at a screen, I don't, I don't have anything to worry about. There's no reason to wear these kinds of glasses at night. But if I am going to, you know, sometimes you have to watch Tiger King or you have to finish that report or something, <laughs> you know, so uh, wear, wear these if you do. Next slide, please. So you should try to keep your bedroom as your sanctuary. Um, it is your sleeping palace and you should reserve your bedroom. It should be cool. It should be clean. It should be a place that you preserve for only sleep, no computer work, not reading, not, um, not doing anything else other than sleep so that your brain knows when you go into your bedroom, it is your place for sanctuary and sleep. Um, and it's really important. A lot of the things that we're talking about today are sleep hygiene. And uh, we've all heard that term, sleep hygiene, but it's really important to set the stage for successful sleep. And by doing that, it means of being very careful what you're filling your mind with in the evening after you're working. You don't want to be, um, you don't want to be um, watching violent television movies or watching those that get your heart racing or making you anxious. You want to be calming yourself down and you know, you don't want to read a murder mystery. You want those very calming effects before you go to bed. It's really important to make sure that you have that good sleep hygiene. On this Excellent. note, actually, one of my favorite quotes from a Toronto psychologist, Jordan Peterson, he says, your room is an external manifestation of your mind. I find that so true for myself. A cluttered room, a cluttered mind, you know? I think that's very true. If only you would have adapted to that as a child. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you watch before you go to sleep, if you watch anything at all? Since you can't Me? watch anything violent, yeah, yeah. I love to watch the Food Network. I just like cooking, gardening, something, something. It's really just... easy going. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. 
All right, next slide. <clears throat> Not that easy. Working on it here. <laughs> there we go. So sure. this may seem like a strange sleep hack, an air purifier. Let me explain. This, this really does make sense. So I have an air purifier in my room. Since getting this air purifier, I will never not have an air purifier in my room, in my house. I think it's incredibly important. Think of it this way. Is that an when energy sleep, drink? Are you drinking caffeine right now? What time is it? We're going to talk about that in, the, in a few slides. Um, <laughs> so think of it this way. When you, when you go to sleep, your whole body goes into recovery mode. If the air quality that you're breathing in is poor and there's dust particles and all sorts of things in the air, then a portion of that budget to recover the body now needs to be set aside and allocated towards um, cleaning these pathogens that are in your lungs now. So I've recommended this to a lot of friends. All of them have said very similar things that this is like night one, you turn this thing on and it, you'll sleep better that night. I personally, this is one of the biggest game changers for me when it came to sleep quality. I didn't realize I didn't have sleep quality. I thought my sleep quality was amazing. I got one of these 20% improvement in, on the first night. I thought it was incredible. So I will always have one of these from now on. I recommend you can get these online I would say for a decent size room, I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend less than 120. If you get a small one, it's almost not even worth it. You probably wouldn't notice a huge difference if you have a big room. If you've got a small office, a small one will do. Um, but I think I've got a decent size master bedroom and I would say I spend 130 bucks online. Um, definitely a good purchase. Exercise is super important. Um, for whatever reason, the research is showing that exercise earlier in the day rather than late in the day allows your body to go through enough cycle time to rest and relax at night. So not recommended for the evening, but definitely recommended for the morning. And always, you know, getting your heart rate up and getting yourself out there is something that helps you uh, relieve stress and allows you to actually catch some Z's. Next slide. Also, avoiding uh, our favorite topics, alcohol and marijuana. Um, so there's a lot of clinical evidence that both alcohol and um, marijuana deprive your body of the recovery that it needs. And what they actually do is they block that rapid eye movement level that you saw on one of the first charts. So um, you can't ever get to that part where you're in the recovery phase. So you'll go through some sleep cycles, but you will just fall short of that rapid eye movement, the REM sleep, and you'll be in the non-REM. So it's really important um, that you avoid these things if you want to achieve great sleep. Next slide. Now, apple cider vinegar and honey, this tip comes from Tim Ferriss. He, you may have heard of him. He runs one of the top 10 podcasts in the world. He's done TED Talks. He wrote the four hour work week, the four hour body. Um, he was an early investor in Uber and Airbnb. Very smart guy. He's, he's really into biohacking. And he says doing apple cider vinegar and honey with hot water before bed. His specific recipe, if you want it real quickly, is two tablespoons ACV, one tablespoon of honey, and one cup of hot water. And he swears by this. I've tried it. I like it. It works really well. It knocks me out. Next slide. Avoid caffeine. Now, Jonathan, let's talk about this. <laughs> um, caffeine is really, um, it, it's, it streams through your body for a lot longer than you think. So if you have a cup of coffee in the morning um, or even a sip of it at noon, at 8 p.m., it's still bioavailable in your body, even though you've lost the high from it. So I know you and I are friends with Five Hour Energy. And um, I've cut way back on that. Now, you know, if I have any, it'll be like a little tiny sip first thing in the morning. But 
I've recently been successful in cutting out all caffeine. I don't know how I've done it during these COVID times, but um, avoiding caffeine after noon is absolutely a necessity if you want to get good sleep. Um, because, you know, sleep is the superhero of your immune system and um, it affects, caffeine definitely affects your adrenal glands and can cause you to go into um, more of a cortisol crisis if you're overstimulating it with caffeine. So it would be helpful to avoid caffeine if you can, Jonathan. So maybe a studio audience question here, but if, well, I'll use my self as example. I do drink caffeine right up till- All day? Sleep, I, at least according to my Fitbit, I sleep well. When I sleep, I get REM and deep sleep. Mm -hmm. Is that, are there people out there that just react differently? I'm not- I, I, I Honestly, you're not alone. I mean, uh, I'm married to a guy. He can drink like a, a double shot of, you know, the strongest coffee you can imagine and just fall asleep in a second. It's about the quality of sleep and the phases that your, your brain goes through and your ability to boost your, um, your system, right? Your immune system and the cortisol response, because you can't avoid the cortisol response when you're drinking caffeine. So um, even though you don't feel it, how much better would you, you'd be able to run 500 miles in a day instead of, you know, your normal 50. Um, yes. <laughs> but I'm just saying, it, it probably would improve your performance. You might be surprised. Fair enough. Jonathan, on this, uh, on this topic, there's a great book by Michael Pollan. I believe it's just called Caffeine. And uh, it's a whole book on the topic. And he was an avid coffee drinker. And he, you know, had caffeine all day, every day. And, and for the entire book, he stopped uh, drinking coffee and drinking caffeine. And he talks about all of the science behind it and his experience of stopping it for the nine months that it took him to write the book. And fascinating read. You should check it out. So obviously he went back to it though, right, Sean? <laughs> uh, he did, yeah. But I mean, it was more like, I mean, this is how I use caffeine. I Lately, I've been doing a little bit more than usual, but typically I drink caffeine about once a quarter. And when I do, I'm talking, it's like three to four ounces at most of a cup of coffee once every two to three months. Um, I, and I'm, I'm really sensitive to it. And I, I'm probably sensitive to it because I don't do it, but also I like to use it as a tool. Um, when I really have a lot of stuff to crank out that day, then I might do some. But if you take it every day, it loses its tool right. aspect of it, right? You know, you're, now you just sort of are dependent on it. And caffeine withdrawals are pretty wicked. Oh, they are. I just, I just have to ask, though, is that gentleman's follow-up book? why I'm doing time. <laughs> why I drink coffee every day now. <laughs> why, why I'm serving three to five in prison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I'll wait for that one to drop. I love it, Jonathan. I love it. <sighs> so uh, next slide is taking a shower before bed. Now, I don't always take a shower before bed, but when I do, I always start on a warm temp and I end off on a cool temperature. If you remember our circadian rhythm slide a few back, your body temperature is warmest at in the afternoon and then it's coldest in the evening. This helps your body go to sleep. So I want to help my body ease it into sleep by keeping my core body temperature down. So I want to lower my body temperature. This is also why it's important to keep a cool or a cold room. They make products that um, will keep your bed cool at night. Um, I've heard great things from those. I've never tried them personally, but I've heard that those would work really well to keep your body temperature cold as well. And I'm in yeah. San Diego here and it's pretty uncommon to have uh, air conditioning and it can be pretty hot in the summer. So that's definitely uh, a major key. Yeah. Avoid food. So what happens when you eat right before bed? Everybody knows this, but it's just something that we want to remind you of as we're giving you these health hacks to try to help you uh, sleep better. 
but avoid food right before sleep because when your body um, has food in the stomach, it has to use a lot of enzymes and horm hormones to break down that food and allow you to digest it. And if you go right to bed after that, then you're not allowed to, you're not allowing your body to rest because it's still having to work on the food. So it's so much better to limit your food intake at least three hours before you go to bed and um, just give your body a rest. It'd be great to be empty, right? That your stomach's empty, that you're not feeling the need to eat. You're not feeling hungry, but you're also just feeling empty so that your brain can really do the work to uh, recover your whole body while you're sleeping. And most importantly, maybe most importantly, I would say is consistency. Going to sleep, waking up at the same time every day is really, really important. This, this will optimize your sleep. This will optimize your circadian rhythm. You, let's say you wake up every day for work at 6 a.m. and then Saturday rolls around and you sleep in until 9.30. You've spent the last five days training your body to go into this early cycle. And then when you sleep in, you ruin it day one and then you ruin it for two days and then start over on Monday. And it's just as hard as you know it is to wake up that early on Monday. And that's one of the reasons. I mean, maybe seven if you had to sleep in, you know, but um, on the weekends. But keeping a consistent routine will definitely improve your quality. And I have a question that I know yeah. in the audience is going to ask, Sean, which is it it is true there is no banking sleep correct so it's not right. i know as a as what i do for my hobby for running you can't sleep extra to be ready to not to be sleep deprived is that true exactly yeah exactly you not only that not only can you not front load sleep you also can't catch up in the way that you think it's not an exact one to one ratio let's say you sleep eight hours every night and then the next night you sleep seven hours you can't sleep nine hours the next night to make up for that if that makes sense um it's not it's not an exact ratio also it stands true that you can't take an hour nap that day because you missed an hour last night it's just not the same the process that goes on when you're sleeping for a whole chunk of night is it can't be compared to a nap in the afternoon or, or something like that when you lose sleep you lose it it's gone. That being yep. said, you know, you, you can catch up in, in ways, but it's not an exact one-to-one -one ratio like, like most people think, if that makes sense. There's a, there's a lot of books on that topic, actually, Jonathan. Uh, that's a great point. I mean, even yeah. um, if you study, I know Sean lives out there and knows a lot of Navy SEALs, but they've done a lot of research on this because they, part of their training, they go through sleep deprivation and, you know, they study them while they do it. And then how do they recover? How fast does their body recover? All of that. And um, evidence is pretty clear that you can't make up for a deficit. Right. And then that's yeah. a follow-up question. You brought up another one that, that somebody wants to know about, which is napping. <laughs> so naps, good, bad. It depends. I think it depends on what you want. I would say if you are so tired and fatigued that you feel like you need a nap just to get through the day and you can go for it. I don't think it's bad. I think if you're napping for too long, then that could definitely disrupt your sleep. What I try to do if I ever nap, which is very rarely, if I ever do, I will set my alarm for 90 minutes. So let's say I'm pretty sure I can fall asleep within 10 minutes. I'll set my alarm for a hundred minutes because I want to make sure that I'm not woken up in the middle of a sleep cycle. So like we talked about earlier yeah. on and the sleep cycle page, one sleep cycle is about 90 minutes long. So I want to make sure that I complete one full cycle and then wake up. You know what I mean? I don't want to wake up in a deep, deep sleep. Right. And, and the other thing about napping, you know, for sure do it if you feel you need to. And, there are people that are immune compromised and fighting, you know, chronic disease, and it's definitely helpful for yeah. them. However, normal individuals, it's 
actually going to steal away from their ability to sleep later on is what, what we see is they're not as tired then at night and they have more problems falling asleep. So right. it's a lot uh, it's a lot better if you can go without and power through during the day so that you really do feel tired at night and you can get that great sleep. And to speak into that too, I, I would say a nap is more of a band-aid. If you are a normal, normal, healthy individual and you're living a normal daily life and you feel this constant need to nap, then maybe there's something else going going on in your life that should be addressed rather than just napping it off. Does that make sense? Yes. Like maybe you're only so, getting six hours a night and you should be getting seven and a half or nine. Yeah. You know? The yeah. two two final questions, because I, I, we could go on and we'll try to follow this up maybe with a blog and some other stuff. So Dr. Bartley, cool. from our industry perspective, well, and even just society, what are the stats? I've, I've seen things that say now more people, there are more wrecks, more accidents from people having sleep deprivation than even possibly alcohol or other things. Is that? That's an excellent point. There, there's clear evidence out there from OSHA and NIOSHA that, um, that sleep deprivation is equal to or worse than being intoxicated or impaired on drug or alcohol. Um, that you're more at risk of having an accident, you're more at risk of making a mistake, you're more at risk of, of not having good reflexes um, than if you're impaired on drugs or alcohol. So um, that's an excellent point. And thank you for bringing that up, Jonathan, but absolutely certain that sleep is important. I've seen where, I've seen where they, they had a group of people who slept for six hours, uh, six to seven hours, sometime in that time range, and all of them tested as if they were legally drunk at 0 .08. And, wow. um, and it also comes with a bias when you're tired that you don't believe it, that you don't feel that way. You know, sometimes when you're buzzed, you're like, okay, I, I can tell that I'm like uh, impaired in some way. <laughs> but when you're tired and you're sleepy, you don't feel that way. And that's another reason why it's incredibly dangerous. Well, I can, as, as Dr. Bartlett knows, I can speak to having done races where I've been up for over 24 hours. Yeah, the 100, wow. 100 K, right? A, a lot yeah. of ultra runners experience the strange, right. they don't remember even having the hallucinations or the lashing out at their running partners and the, right. I, I can understand how that would happen. The, the last one, because probably everybody watching or almost is wearing some kind of wearable uh, that we're, you know, we're tracking sleep, we're tracking fitness as a whole, but how accurate, how much can those help us? Or, you know, the, the question is, how much can that really help me manage my sleep? I, we know they're not a hundred percent, but. No, but, they're not a hundred percent, but they're really a good, um, barometer of how you're doing. Um, if, you're very, if you're very restless, it's going to show that if you're not getting that deep sleep. Um, and um, I think for people that think that they, there's also those people that think I, they haven't slept at all. I, I don't know if you've ever talked to them and they probably are sleeping somewhat, um, but I think these are great devices to help us understand the importance of sleep. And I know, for example, um, you can sign up on uh, Fitbit's webpage and participate on all the research that they have on all of us who wear these devices. Um, they know probably more about uh, the world of sleep than anyone, and they're collecting data all the time. And I've participated in a few of their webinars and it's very interesting. They, they'll let anybody participate. It's, um, it's just something, it's a barometer. It's not a fail safe, it's not an exact science, um, so to speak, but it does, um, it does encourage you, right? To get your exercise and to get your sleep and to be mindful of it. And I think that's one of the most important things. And, yeah. and I guess, um, just, you know, we want to leave you with a few pointers here at the end because we always like to give you 
you know, a few strategies that will help you. And this was, um, you know, Mr. Trip here, Peter yeah, Trip. Peter Trip. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so don't be like Peter Trip. Don't try to be the hero. Um, I mean, it was a good cause that he was using it for, but we just want to leave you with maybe three helpful hints. We know that we're in a pandemic and that we have this coronavirus 19. Um, and we know that a lot of people are anxious about it. They have all kinds of things to be anxious about. And uh, one thing that um, is really helpful for individuals and they rarely will take advantage of it is set aside some time in the evening. If you're anxious about something, set aside some time and even like set the time aside to even think about everything that you're anxious about. And even if you're prone to do it, write it down. Write down every single thing that is bothering you and get it out there so that you really have thought it all the way through. Here are all the things that are bothering you. And then what happens is your mind will release it because you know you've captured it. You've thought it all out. You've spent the time. And now you can let it go. You don't have to think about it anymore when you're trying to sleep. You can readdress it tomorrow when you open that book again. Sean, do you have? Great point. Yeah, and on top of that, um, there are tons of online resources for this. One of them is calm.com. They've popped up in the last couple of years and have become pretty big. Listen to a meditation or a bedtime story. You know, if you have your phone next to you, you can set a timer from the iPhone's native timer app um, on the, on, that comes on your phone. And whatever is playing on your phone, you can set it to stop whenever you want it to. So listen to a meditation or a, or a bedtime story to get you to start feeling drowsy and sleepy and, and drift off. And then lastly, I think it's not something that I would encourage, but if you're really struggling with sleep, um, take some melatonin. Just try two milligrams or five milligrams once in a great while. It really helps you. If you if you do all the things that we talked to you about today with the blue light and minding your circadian rhythm, your melatonin will peak at night and you will feel sleepy and fall asleep. But if you power through that and you need another little peak, take it. I don't recommend that you take it every night, but yeah if you really need to get that sleep, then take a little bit of that uh, melatonin. It is a hormone. So I, I really don't encourage it all the time. All right, well, thank you, uh, Dr. Bartlett. Thank you, Sean Bartlett, fascinating. I know we're gonna have tons more questions and hopefully we can follow up on this. And uh, so we encourage everybody to keep tuning in to the Cedric Virtual Rims Week and uh, stay awake because we got a lot of great content. Thank you both. <laughs> we wish so you great sleep. <laughs> Thank you.